Hello, and welcome to the Four Seasons on Saturday, a program devoted to the career and recordings of Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. This is part two of our sessions, Path to the Box Set, discussing the process that led up to the release of the Four Seasons Career Spanning Legacy Collection, Working Our Way Back to You, this just past June. In part one, Ken Charmer detailed the series of events that unfolded over a 20 year period of time, trying to establish the existence of the Motown unreleased four season tracks, an effort continually met with de denials, deceitful denials at that. And then in 2018, seemingly out of the blue, Snapper Music Company of London announces they had gotten the approval of the Four Season Partnership, Bob Gordio and Frankie Valley, to proceed with this legacy collection. And then, Ken, you and other members of the UK Four Season Appreciation Society are invited to a meeting and asked for suggestions. What should be in this collection? You all probably took less than a second to reply, my God, the Motown unreleased, of course. I believe that's uh, where we left off. Yeah. So we're fortunate, we're fortunate to have back Ken Charmer to resume his truly first-hand accounts, and also George Perez of George Music for All Four Seasons, and Chuck Walker, our West Coast agent, our agent provocateur. And I'm Tony Colatrella. Okay, Ken, so at this meeting, you met Bob Fisher, and eventually uh, the two of you became joint track researchers. As such, what were uh, your objectives, your goals? What were you trying to accomplish in the box set? Well, we, we felt that uh, we needed to see the big picture. Uh, the big picture being a really big artist and a big collection. And at the time, I don't think we realized just how complex and difficult the process would be and that um, unforeseen events would come to play in it. But we'll come on to that. Um, so after the meeting, we were the main compilers of whatever else could be found. Um, but... Uh, the aim and objectives that we set as as two sort of co-compilers was first of all to find and decide upon the best master for uh, the tracks to be used in the box set for each of the albums because it was fundamentally a set of albums the original albums not the hit albums and also to check the tapes were complete the album tapes were complete with no tracks that had been pulled in the past and not returned to the tape, which it was soon apparent had happened. Also, there were other non-LP tracks on tapes and we needed to establish if the versions were unique or, or alternatives to the album versions or whether they could be ignored. Second objective really was to find as many unreleased tracks as possible from the sessions or live tapes or other sources that we could perhaps find, including our own archives and obviously the, the Motown archive at Iron Mountain. So the box set was sufficiently different to any past releases that was necessary for from a sales perspective and, and a price perspective. Um, and as comprehensive an anthology as is possible. So Snapper acknowledged these um, via the project coordinator, Ian Crockett, and so we moved on to develop the project. Um, first and foremost, the main tape researcher who had access to um, the Four Seasons storage in LA, Bill Inglet, was commissioned with, with Bob Gordio's agreement, and he had done all the tape research that Bob Gordio has ever done since the CD era, era began. And um, he was to do a thorough research. Um, so he produced a chrono chronological album list with, which was compiled of what we believed and knew existed for review as master tapes. And these would be digitized from the analog tapes 
plus anything else he uncovered. Um, you know, similar to much of his previous tape research back in the late 80s. Um, so he started working with his engineers, transfer engineers, to transfer, um, first of all, tape box scans, um, so we could actually see what was written on the boxes um, and the track listings that were there. And also digital copies of the, of the tapes were done and they were sent to the UK mastering engineer, Reynolds Mastering. And so Bob Fisher and I were able to view the scans and to call for any we wanted to review. We, at that point, assumed that uh, Bill Inglet was, you know, testing the quality of the tapes. And, and But basically, he was sending everything that, that was on his list, and in some cases, duplicates of uh, tapes. Um, so our focus was really to see what those tapes contained and immediately became clear that there were quite a few non-album singles and other tracks, including the VJ delivery tapes. Now, I think Chuck had a question about, about this. Uh, it's, uh, uh, my understanding is that the, uh, when the, um, Bob Crew, Genius Music, and the Four Seasons sued VJ, and VJ ultimately went bankrupt. As part of that settlement, they delivered to the Four Seasons via Bob Crew two sets of tapes, a set of mono tapes, which were the released mono recordings on the VJ label, and a set of stereo tapes, which contained the stereo version. And that basically is, uh, is all that exists from the VJ era that I'm aware of. Is that correct? Yes, that's that's correct. Wow. Yeah, and we 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 found that there were some anomalies in that. Um, there were some interesting tracks that were there, and there were some tracks that were missing. But I won't dwell on the tracks. I think that's perhaps for when we go through uh, the box set contents in another session. But we basically had the VJ tapes, and there were ten of them, five mono five stereo tapes containing 70 to, to 73 uh, tracks. So, but it soon became clear when we were getting these uh, tapes over that basically based on the scans that no comprehensive catalog listing of, of the partnership archive existed and that all of the album masters were actually safety copies, possibly two or three generations from the original studio masters. So this was perceived at the time as a potential problem regarding not just the VJ, but some of the Philips albums as well, particularly as we were getting um, mono tapes that had been found and stereo tapes, the stereo tapes having been used before in previous transfers. Um, Bill had part partially reviewed what tapes existed, but he advised that these needed further research to identify the quality. That seemed to be left to us and uh, um, uh, Peter Reynolds. The original masters were still either at the original studios or transferred to whoever had inherited the studio's assets or destroyed, as we were told, regarding the Bell Studio Masters, uh, the Philips Masters, when they had a clear out and gave a deadline for when those tapes should be collected. And when they weren't collected, they were so supposedly destroyed, as we were told. Um, but we weren't clear on the um, other labels and what had happened to the original masters of those. So we were still looking at other sources as well. But we knew that the delivery tapes were there, so that was a VJ bonus that meant we didn't have to rely on uh, what what other very very old looking boxes had on them. Um, this, uh, uh, Ken, yeah. When you when you say scans of tape boxes, are you just indicating that they were photos of the tape boxes? Just yeah, they took copies a or scans. Yeah, yeah. You know. and, and that and that was sent so you could yeah. look at 
this. So they they well, were all, they a lot of them had um, yellow post-it notes on them mm -hmm. that said were like notes about what that was the original master of yeah. of a certain track or the tracks had been pulled to you know a hits collection. Right, and but that, it didn't didn't necessarily indicate all of the individual tracks that were in that tape box. No, and there there was one occasion which I'll come on to, where the, the, there was one missing track, but there was also some other um, serious problems related to it. You've got to remember, this was the 1960s. It's an awful long time ago for tapes to be stored and still be in yeah. pristine condition. And I know some of them probably had to be baked to um, make them fit to run through the machines. Now, um, also, you, you use different terms. You, you said the original master. So that was the actual re uh, original studio recording. Uh, no, I mean, I mean the sorry, I meant to say the safety copies um, yeah. may have deteriorated and um, some of them will have needed baking to recover the, the tracks. But at the same time, we also knew that the, this had been done before and that there was a a store of masters uh, of Four Seasons tracks that were on CD since 1988. Right. So there, there are there are several versions of the album masters that have come from either one, two or more transfers that Bill Inglot will have done in the past. The I, did, I did speak to him about this and he wasn't clear on how many times he had gone in and yeah. copied those tapes, but... Um, we had what we had, but we didn't really have the time to check everything. We had to rely on the fact that Bill had supplied the safety copy tape and the safety copy tape was intact. That was an assumption we made because there was so much more to do. So we hadn't become aware of any of, any of the limitations of the tapes that Bill had found. But we were happy that he'd recovered the Mono Masters. Uh, safety copies of all of the 60s tapes including the unheard mono masters of genuine imitation live gazette and half and half both of which were previously unreleased bill searched out any other tape boxes of mixed sundry tracks he also sorted through tape boxes with notes indicating four seasons or frankie valley involvement um, and he transferred those for us to research but the hits albums or the non-original compilations, many of which we knew were there on safety copies, were not to be included in this contract with Snapper Music because right. it, the original list was original albums. But some would be flagged up for research for alternative versions were different. And the main one we immediately found uh, especially unique was Edizione Doro. And that was right. found to, to exist with two master tapes safety copies and uh, you know other hit albums were discarded but that was judged important enough to include in full due to the several uh, unique stereo mixes included well, the, the, uh, these other hit compilations would just simply be redundant it would be superfluous you would just be kind well, of we regarded we regarded them as such but i'm not sure that was a good decision uh, in retrospect but i'll come on to why oh. uh, Later, so is it possible that Chuck knows uh, more about Edition Odoro um, from from work he did on it well, himself? The, the original edition of Edition Odoro and the CD version are, are like night and day different because we couldn't get the original tapes when that was made. But but the, there are some versions on on Edition Odoro that are are similar, I believe, to be the same masters as on the Gold Hits albums. But some of them, uh, I'm concerned, might be different and. Uh, the mono version may be different than a stereo in the way that uh, yeah. it was mixed by crew or other people who mixed we, those albums. Yeah, we didn't yeah. know that um, a crew had mixed, uh, had found in the, re we got a tape of Bob Crew doing a research through the uh, tapes with his tape engineer. And he was yeah. fast forwarding through the tapes. Uh, yeah. Yes, if, if I, yes, if, if I may, Ken, I was going to mention that. Uh, that that is a very interesting uh, listen that you posted on your YouTube channel. Now, is that something that you discovered going through these tapes? Yeah, um, Bill Ingler. Oh, found, wow! Bill Ingler found okay. it to us, and and we were thinking at one stage to include it, but um, we thought that because the tracks were incomplete 
and and you know it was good to have but i thought you know youtube outlet was a, a better outlet to share with everybody sure. and, and just and just if I may add, right and and just to hear bob crew in that studio that was amazing amazing yeah, yeah. well the the versions he flagged up and are marked up on that um note that we had are the alternative stereo versions that were included on Odisio Nodoro. But on Odisio Doro, they're there in full. So the biggest find of that was um, Gail Come Running, of course, because yeah. the actual alternative stereo version is actually better than the 45 version and had never appeared anywhere before. But and there, those are things we'll talk about in, in a, a future series. But it was a okay. number of additional non-album master that were flagged up for research that was the important thing there were there were three tapes that um had mercury singles supposedly and so we had to check each of these tracks out to check whether they were the original single masters we found in some cases that they weren't um and we found that our mono uh, singles archive which contained dubs from the 45s were actually more accurate in a, in three or four cases. So that was part of the the process of checking that. There were also the um, the polycomp tapes, which were Valley Solo um, tracks that were on 45, and we found that those were some of them were pseudo stereo, but there were no single versions of. Frankie's first four 45s. So we then had to um, get our colleague, Ray Nickel, to pull his 45s off and record them at studio quality and supply them uh, to us uh, for transfers to uh, Peter Reynolds. So those were all supplied directly. So they should be, and I can't say I've had time to check them since, but they should be an exact um, master. Okay. So Thank you. The, the process of checking these tapes ran, ran through eight volumes of transfers of maybe eight to 15 tapes in each set. And so they all had to be checked. So it was basically hundreds of hours of listening and cross-checking and discussing, flagging up and uh, referencing the material that should be included. So that's where that's where Bob Fisher and I became the master track uh, researchers. So we continued that. Um, I think we looked at the Philips, Private Stock, Warner Curb, and the other studio-copied analog tapes with them all being safety copies but there were just three tapes of multi-track studio session tape these were 16 track and they were all dated 1970 and they were all transferred by ken roberts and it seemed strange that when um bill Inglet told us sent us these he said that only um two of them had vocals on them Ken Roberts was the uh, engineer at Phillips. Is that right? He was the engineer that um, the Four Seasons used at Phillips. And I think um, they worked with him subsequently on some things, but he was involved with them, I know, in the 1990s as well. Um, was there Bill agreed to mix these, and he did mono and stereo mixes and sent them to us. There was one thing I was I was concerned about, though with them and um, there were 25 tracks there and they were all basically unreleased or alternative versions mm -hmm. and the strange thing about them is it says copied from real 14 and it says tk which to me means take and it'll take say take six or take eight or take 14 and that's written on the box so if these hmm. are all instrumentals, why did they copy so many takes? You know, the takes specifically, why Why just there would be one instrumental mix 
of of the instrumental track. So I'm still a bit nonplussed about why we didn't get stuff. But then some things happened in the future that made me even more concerned that we haven't got the full picture on these tapes and we still may not have at this time. That, that, yeah, that does raise a very intriguing question because, of course, we always talk about unreleased in terms of Motown unreleased, but this was 25 tracks from Phillips and uh, you're, you're at least maybe thinking that or you you did say that most of these were unreleased, although they were just instrumental tracks except for two. Yeah. Why yeah. would you copy so many right. instrumental tracks when you were leaving the label? Yeah, so I are mean, there more unreleased? Well, I mean, how did you have the right? How would you have the rights to them? Um, well, maybe you did have the rights to them because you recorded them. Uh, anyway, it, it's something for further discussion. Uh, and I'll go through some of the titles in a future session uh, when we talk about the priorities. Um, but it was a separate, or it was all a separate um, research project to the situation regarding the Universal Motown stories research. Because yeah. the very start of the project, I wrote to Andy Scurro at Universal Vault Services regarding our appointment and offered him the tape index and the artist cards regarding uh, the Motown, which which we talked about before, uh, as a collaborative effort to engage him as a universal tape researcher. Well, I didn't receive a reply then or at any subsequent time, as Universal only conducted correspondence with Ian Crockett at Snapper and with Bob Gordio. So we highlight to Snapper, the Motown index is of multi-track, session tapes that is 16 tracks with all studio takes and any stereo mono test mixes and original mixes so the final mix of anything that was released and many unreleased uh, tracks were identified as potentially being there in our previous research i spoke about last time um and an agreement or contract was was uh was placed by Snapper to pull the tapes from the Iron Mountain Vault storage listed in our compiled tape index and identify the contents of re unreleased tracks. Ian Crockett sent our tape index to Andy Scurro of him to get the tapes and check them for unreleased tracks. So none of the detailed research of tape box listings by the Vault services at Universal Motor was shared with Bob Fisher and I, except we were supplied with one tape box scanned by Andy Scurro and an email listing by Andy stating that a review of the written records on the tape box had been conducted and a list of 11 tracks with potential vo vocals were indicated on tape boxes and there were a possible nine more tapes that still had to be done with potential Maybe we should vocals. go over that it might be it might be important to go over that because so right from the start you offer help to uh, Universal Motown, specifically to Andy Scoro. He's the he's the person in charge of the Universal Motown vaults. Yeah, he's the head of vault services. Right. So you offer your help to him, but you you you, you didn't even get a reply, like saying thank well, you for. Well, all as we got was a copy of a of a, a tape uh, of a um a memo. list a list of tracks and memos okay. between him and his boss uh, Gene Zakowitz. Um, and he was leery of supplying us with any more tape yeah. boxes for reasons he wouldn't put in writing. But but Snapper, if, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, by uh, entering into a contract, they had to pay. <laughs> Didn't they have to pay Universal Motown for, for Universal Motown to go into the vaults to look for yeah. this? Yeah, you have to raise a purchase order at Motown for any... Yeah. Um, tracks uh, you're, back. You're 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 paying them for them to go look into their vaults for certain certain tapes. Yeah, but that's the way any research of yes. uh, Iron yeah. Yeah. is is conducted. But but yet, uh, well, the only feedback was between uh, Universal Motown, Andy Scoro, and this Ian Crockett at at Snapper. Yeah. So you really, you and, you and Bob Fisher really had no idea what was going no. on. Oh, we, yeah. were third, we were third parties and uh, we, um, 
you know, we we were really excluded from uh, the actual tape research. And in fact, at that stage, Bob, um, uh, well, I'll go on to, to say there were a couple of other things that happened at the same time that that tended to contribute to the lack of communication. Uh, the mm -hmm. COVID, um, COVID yeah. delayed research and sure the studios were closed for quite a while. And, um, and so transfers in 2019 and 2020 were, were perhaps put on hold and, and so was the research at Universal. So in the meantime, John Pingree supplied his memorabilia, which is the biggest collection we know of, of memorabilia on the Four Seasons. Limberlin supplied scans of the albums and the picture sleeves. Uh, I supplied unreleased tracks that we'd collected over the decades and rare photos. And Ray Nickel wow. uh, did the dubs of the missing Mono 45 masters that I'd spoke about earlier. We also agreed to supply a set of collector's notes with the history of the recording so that people understood the importance of the whole project and the importance of each album in the context of the time and also of the bonus tracks. And I completed those um, collector's notes with the help of George Ingram over a period um, and with others like Paul Evans. Uh, great write-up, by the way. Great, great yeah, little and, booklet. Oh. Yeah, and, and we're very pleased with what we're able to write. And we were happy that Snapper's senior executives agreed that this should be supplied as a separate booklet. And it yes. was, and, and, and Ian Crockett did fight our corner and say this was absolutely essential um, to help the fans enjoy the box set. But, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, at this time with with um, Bob Gordio reviewing the, the Motown situation, there was initially a lack of willingness by Bob to review 16-track Motown multi-track tapes. He wanted stereo mixdowns and a set of tapes, uh, and, and that was a very costly um, research exercise. So somehow Ian Crockett and Bob and Universal agreed and maybe paid for a set of tapes to be transferred to him based on the titles for him and Frankie to review and see what they remembered on the list. Well, you have to remember, of course, that, be, that much of this stuff was going to be released in the UK and being more than 50 years old, some of it was technically and legally speaking, potentially owned by Bob Gordio and not universal. So rather than get into oh. that sort of argument, you know, an accord was being reached here. We don't know what, what went on behind the scenes, it wasn't shared with us. But um, we got no confirmation of, of which of the 29 Motown 16 track production tapes we'd identified were supplied to Bob Cordia. We, we never got any further data regarding what or wasn't supplied or if any listing tests, if any had been conducted by Andy Scurrow before the supply to Bob Bob Gordia. All we had was a list of tapes he checked and just a comment, no vocal, yes, two vocals, test vocal, things like that on the tape boxes he'd seen. But it was clear at the time that he hadn't conducted listening tests. Yeah, it, it, I was going to say, it, so he, he said that he did a review of the written record on the tape boxes. So he was looking at these tape boxes and seeing what was written on them and and simply going by that well you've got you've got the one tape box that that we were sent and if you look at that it's got listening to yesterday and it's got star on it and star was the unreleased track on that tape mm -hmm. but you can see that each of the tracks are listed so the guitars the strings the drums the bass the vocals they're all listed on that tape box so you can tell whether there was a vocal done now these are big tapes they they run 90 minutes yeah. so the there are plenty of takes and and um you know so the 16 tracks would be there there might not be a vocal on that but the a vocal might have been done separately and then mixed to a stereo take for test purposes 
Some were copied, we know, completed and copied to tea tapes, which were safety copies and stored elsewhere in the Motown archive. So there's, <laughs> there's still a million and one questions about what went on in this process. And uh, uh, those 11 tracks that he said had potential vocals, that was from just one tape box. No, no, he went through. Oh. That was from 29, 29 tape he, boxes? No, he went, he, he, he said he'd looked at 11 tape boxes. He found, he looked through a number of tape boxes. He didn't specify how many. Oh, okay. uh, he found 11 with vocals, where it said with vocals. 11 tracks. He, he didn't listen so, to those tapes. So do you now have a, a listing by tape box? It is accurate of what is really on the tape in that box? No, and there was always a saying with past Motown research that you never know what's on the tape until you okay. play it. And they have found many, many unreleased tracks by groups like The Temptations, The Four Tops, you know, um, <laughs> Diana Ross and the Supremes, Martha Reeves. The, the list goes on endlessly. You go th you go through the, the cellar full of Motown and many of those tracks have been unearthed by simply playing the tapes. Now, we don't know in this situation. All else I can do is tell you what we did and try not to be too suspicious of what went on and whether, well, things were certainly kept from us. The reasons for that are not known, probably because we operated on an open and transparent basis. And Motown Universal don't like to work that way in the compilation of um, albums or for release. They're always secretive and always have been. Um, so that was, that was it as far as we could do. So as our research uh, continued, we focused on the, the Four Seasons Partnership storage saves from Bill Inlet. And um, we suddenly received word the 14 tracks were approved by Bob Gordio for inclusion. Great news, says Ian Crockett. And so whatever research he and his son Shannon had undertaken, which obviously included listening um, and mixing some of these tracks to stereo, um, one was almost immediately rescinded. It was 14 tracks and it became 13. I will love you like a man was rescinded. No explanation was given leading us to speculate that this was a politically correct decision because of LGBTQ concerns, perhaps. Correct, Constantly. yeah. I asked, as did Bob Fisher to Ian Crockett at Snapper, if he could go back to Bob Gordy and ask if we could get more approval to more unreleased tracks, as we knew they were more completed on the tapes from the listing. Um, and even from Andy Scurrow's research, we knew that there, were, there was more stuff there. He found vocals, um, which, which we'll come on to discuss in a future session, um, that haven't got through, for whatever reason. Uh, all of the Motown tracks approved by Bob Gordia were in our tape index. And so that showed the accuracy of the work that we'd done with the paper records. Um, but there was no explanation why only 13 of a potential 30 to 40 uh, that have been identified in, in their paper records were included. So he, Ian said he would speak with Bob Gordio and see if it was possible to include more Motown unreleased. He didn't do this, as far as I know, as it was overtaken by events um, and with, with concentration on the rest of the listing. So the masters of 13 Motown unreleased mixes were shared with Bob Fisher and I. And I also found some duplicates on Motown tapes amongst the storage at LA as listening mix copies, because they were only half speed. You know, if um, they were either 15 inch or seven and a half inch per second uh, reel to reel tapes. And they were supplied in 1973 to Bob Gordio. So they turned out to be alternate mixes to the 13 approved. 
but some of them were actual final masters for an album Motown proposed to issue in 1974 before the group and crew decided to leave Motown. So permission was sought to include the tracks that we'd found, which was only one side of this proposed album. And uh, we sought to include them, plus more tracks known to be um, completed masters and give them Motown master numbers. So they're there, you know, the same as the release tracks listed yeah. as a completed master. So isn't it, yeah. In, in retrospect, I mean, that is, that is very, very interesting because since 1973, 74, when they left Motown, Motown, as well as Bob Gordio and his lawyer, have been denying that any unreleased tracks exist, yet he had them in his own storage, right? He had, he had, he had, he had yeah, the ones he approved, he'd yeah. already, he already had had the, uh, well, some of the final mixes or alternative mixes sent to him. And, in 1973. <laughs> yeah, I mean, wow. one example that's not in the box in the in the box set was there was a tape with three versions of "With My Eyes Wide Open." There was one mixer with a heavy driving drum beat, which sounded almost disco, um, and there were two stereo mixes, one with a different emphasis on guitars and another one on strings. But Frankie's vocal is the same on all three mixes, but there are very interesting alternatives. Um, they didn't get into the box set, and I don't remember the reason why that happened, but I didn't think that any uh, of these eight alternative tracks would actually make it in, you know, because Motown would have to approve it, and Motown weren't giving us anything more. So, but they did get included in the end. So at the very end, um, we were we struck lucky and instead of getting just 13 tracks we were able to compile a CD with 22 with noticeable differences in the instrumentation or vocal on the alternative versions so um, Snapper decided not to pursue further tracks with Motown and just to focus on the LA store tracks and urge Bob Fisher and I to research more unreleased Early 21 arri 2021 arrived with the project delayed um, due to COVID and other snapper projects, which had also been delayed, that were in mastering. Mastering on, on this set oh, clearly had not started except for some sample albums, which were sent to us as, as tests by the engineer. And that revealed some problems regarding the 1960s tape quality. There were an example, there were two copies of the Sherry album, the safety copies, and a third copy, which actually said reconstructed master, stereo master. And so lots of questions about this. And the, the actual sample tape that we got, we found wasn't a full frequency version. A full frequency version would, would have a sound measurement up to 20 kilohertz on a, on a meter scale. But the one that was uh, worked on by the engineer only went up to 11,000 kilohertz. So the top frequencies, which is basically the real peaks of Frankie Valli's um, falsetto, were sort of um, uh, compressed uh, for whatever reason on those uh, old safety copies. Um, the engineer found all the tracks except for one missing track on the transfers. Uh, which was mis missing on the digital tape transfer, so hadn't been put back on the original tape, and that was Living Just For You, uh, which I supplied from the ACD masters that we had. And we also had by this time submitted four sets of fan group collected songs for our inclusion, around 100 or more from our unreleased and 45 dubs and our digital archive live tracks, things not found in the LA storage, and the vinyl dubs from Ray Nickel. The partnership wow. didn't have master tapes for those. So by this time, we realized the storage was a real mess. 
with no proper cataloging or notes through the tapes and their versions or their quality. So masters of up to 12 unique 45s were clearly not in existence and not been previously well dubbed from the 60s singles um, put on tape. These were mainly Frankie Valley's early solo 45s, as I said before, and Ray Nickel and I dubbed and supplied those missing dubs. Interestingly enough, one, one dub was uh, Deep Inside Your Love, the ballad B-side of um, Book of Love, I think it was. Yes, Book of Love, right. Yeah, that didn't exist. So I, I dubbed that and, and uh, forwarded that for remastering. Bill Inglet was then pushed and commissioned uh, with an extra fee to find more, and he unearthed several unreleased track, including acetates and alternative versions to the albums and the 45 issued. I pushed and um, he had finally found Killing Time, which was an outtake from the Street Fighter album, and also the stereo version of Good Night, My Love, which uh, wasn't on the original uh, stereo album, Master, and at last appeared on the Looking Back album. And that's where I'd identified that missing Master. Uh, anyway, he found that. So Snapper were happy. We had tested all the main sources. You know, we'd found things like the Lost Disco album, all those tracks from Sigma, uh, sound studios, which we'll come on to talk about in more more detail in future sessions. Um, that would be great. Yeah, and Snapper um, decided to proceed to the production stage with everything, um, including mastering, artwork, book editing, and completion of licensing uh, to be done, which we were at that time assisting with. So, Chuck, I think at this stage you had a question for me. Yeah. I, I... Ken, as I've gone through the uh, the box set, the um, to my ears, some of the CDs sound, well, I'm going to use the word different, maybe the better word is inconsistent in the way that the sound quality is on them. Was there any direction given to Snapper about establishing a, uh, a benchmark sound to compare all the CDs against for the entire set? Yeah, the one, Chuck, I, I, I wrote to... Um... Uh, Peter Reynolds right at the beginning saying that our experience was that the Four Seasons best sounding mixes were at, uh, on a testing on a dynamic range meter, hit a dynamic range meter of 11 or 12 and that 10 to 12 is regarded as the industry standard for pop music uh, on CD by um, companies like Yamaha and, and other major um, recording studios. Um, so he knew about that, um, and he said, when you're listening and testing, just use your ears. You know, that's, that was the only yeah. comment I got back from him, and the only, I never had a conversation with him at all. So there was never any discussion about sound quality. Um, so a final list was compiled for 44 CDs uh, with the vinyl mono um, Jenny Mutation Life Gazette included uh, as an extra and sent to Bob Gordio in May 2022 for approval. He approved all but four tracks. He, uh, he, he didn't want Charisma Extended included. Uh, he didn't want... Uh, yeah, it had been released on the 2008 anthology, so we had it anyway. So, yeah. But it was it was supposed to be a collection of all released tracks. So that, that's one that didn't make it. For a reason, I do not know. Uh, there was an East Me Sweats demo, which wasn't in great sound quality, but it was very interesting because there was a much greater involvement of the Beach Boys in the mix. It was, it was quite interesting for that reason. Um, the I Still Care demo was turned down, um, and the Killing Time extended version, which runs about uh, 50 seconds, 50, 70 seconds more. Um, but I still care. The demo somehow in the uh, admin um, managed to stay in, yeah. which was great from my point Good. of view. But not when we yes. come, well, not when we come to the final uh, was a happy review. So, yeah. the, so the list of over eight hundred and thirty tracks was yeah. compiled, and with every track, 
I had included the location data from the transfers. So, you know, if it was a particular transfer, then I made a note that that's where it was to come from. Um, and we'd also agreed, Bob Fisher and I, and that, that we'd agreed that we should use the VJ delivery tech because we found that the VJ reels three and five in mono and stereo were in fact the best masters we'd ever heard of the VJ tracks. Wow. So I identified each track on those tapes, even though I didn't have them all, and said those should be checked for the sound quality rather than using the already safety copy album masters, which were obviously three or four generations down from those delivery tapes. Th those delivery tapes would have come from the, the main masters at VJ. So um, that was something that we were happy with. We were happy that we'd sourced everything and the engineer knew exactly where to find stuff. And obviously our, some of the tracks were from our own four volumes of um, supplied tracks digitally that, that we'd collected. Um, so we supplied the final collector's note for inclusion as a draft in a separate booklet and then Suddenly, we were stunned with the shock news that Bob Fisher passed away after a heart attack on October the 7th, 2021. Um, what a tragedy. Point, yeah, it was a terrible tragedy. Oh. At that time, we'd worked on the review and the compilation for over three years, him and I, on a daily basis. You know, most days of the week, we were talking to one another about a tape, uh, whether it was a good tape, whether it should be included, where it should be put whether it would fit on the CD, whether there was enough space, did we think? So everything ground to a halt then, but coordination of the contents and the mastering from then on was with Snapper's in-house credits and publishing team. Uh, this and I wasn't consulted again uh, for um, until um, May the following year, 2022 by which time they'd done all their work and compiled final drafts uh, and completed the mastering. So I was supplied, uh, Ian said to me, oh, haven't I supplied you with the, the proofs uh, for proofreading? And I said, no, I've not been involved in anything. I've sent everything to you and um, the, t you know, the people in-house who are doing this and to, uh, to Peter, the engineer. Um, so I was provided uh, with a draft proof copy of the book and the listings and the credits to discover when I read read them through carefully that there were seven missed tracks and there was minimal time because basically I only had a fortnight to review and comment on anything uh, for before it went to uh, publication, production, release, which was planned for December that year. So Snapper reviewed my comments at a senior level. Um, Cliff Dane agreed to reinstall all seven tracks, some of which I resupplied. So mastering samples of four completed discs were sent to me for review because I asked you know, about the quality. And I found that two were excellent and two below standard expected. Surprisingly, uh, the addition of Doro didn't hit the uh, dynamic range uh, uh, level of 10, a minimum of 10, uh, a maximum of 12 would have been better because I'd supplied a, uh, a master from vinyl at a dynamic range of 12. But when, when what we got is a dynamic range of nine, which is, which is below, which it just means it's been compressed and it's, it's really louder and there's, there's less less distance between the quietest and the loudest. So you just don't have as good a listening experience, but you might be fooled because it sounds a bit louder. Um, but the, the main one that I was dissatisfied with was my own master of bachelor's three tape, from, which had come from John Piver. The one I had supplied, um, I'd supplied two, one in mono, one in stereo. Uh, and that was my sole, input to the sound quality. I didn't like the Bachelors 3, but they agreed 
to change to the one I had supplied. And so that's the master you've got in there, which is a mono hybrid. So as a result of the lack of involvement in the mastering and quality checking and proofreading, I advised I'd been prevented from having involvement in the final stages as Bob and I had planned. And I could therefore not accept being listed in the proof copy as co-producer with Bob. So I said, you know, if you want to give Bob that honour in his, you know, as his legacy, fine, but not me. Because I I could only say that I was the master track advisor on behalf of the fans for the research process I'd just described. So at the time can, I, Yeah. Can, can, I, can I just add something? But I mean your your involvement in this project is so um I don't know if the right term is 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 valuable, important to the project itself. Well, it, 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 yeah, it was a massive project and it, it was a massive involvement and it was, yeah, yes. it was three and a half years of my life on a daily basis. Yes, huge. Um, and But, you know, it was a labour of love and I was doing it on behalf of, all, of everybody out there who's, who's a fan and would want to pay what turned out to be, you know, a very high, we knew it was going to be a high price, but it was rumoured to be around 300 uh, pounds or three hundred and thirty dollars, um, and then it went up because of the time delays to three hundred uh, fifty. Um, but look at the amount of content that one gets for that yeah, price. It, it it wasn't all down down to me, you know. The, I mentioned the other guy right. in the group who supplied a lot of the stuff that I was interested only in one thing, and that is the sound. Correct. Right. I knew that I, I did some work for Rachel on identifying and dating the photographs. Um, and um, she was grateful for that. And um, But she did a fantastic job on the design. And I, mm. I, you know, it was absolutely brilliant. The book is okay. The collector's notes I like because they're, they're accurate and they're quality checked by really good people like George Ingram and Paul Airbans. Um, and um, so I was happy with the content as much as I could be. Um, but I wasn't happy with the amount of unreleased tracks that were in there. And I I right. wrote this on, on the Facebook groups, but I was criticised by the CEO of Snapper in an email for asking Bob Gordio for more Motown unreleased. Oh, and he accused me of being angry towards Bob. Um, yeah. Well, I refuted this allegation. It was a simply, I was making a statement of frustration on behalf of fans that despite requests for more on release tracks, neither Snapper or Bob Gordio had offered any explanation of why this was limited. If you've got an explanation, you can accept the reasoning behind it. Sure. No was there any a... feedback on the Motown tape research other than what was approved. Like I said before, nothing from Andy Scurro, nothing on, you know, the full um, checking of the tapes. So there still remains a list of 20 tracks at Motown, which we don't know about, and which still, in my opinion, need further research or confirmation. I don't want to be unfair, because <laughs> <laughs> obviously we don't know all the circumstances going on at the time at Snapper, but it, it, it definitely seemed like a bit of a cop out there. You went to them asking to go to Bob Gorio to ask for more unreleased, and they just turn around and say, oh, well, we don't want to do that. Why don't you go? Why don't you no, go back? No, no, wait, did, they didn't say, why don't you go? I, I just took it upon myself to- No, no, why don't you go back to the Four Season Partnership storage and look for more Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what we were asked to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yes, I mean, that seemed like a bit of a cop-out. No, we don't want to go to Bob Goodle. You, you go look for more somewhere else. That's what it seems like. But I did flag up yeah. other sources, and they did think about following other sources. But I think maybe cost boundaries by this time were, were tight. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm-, I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to criticize and talk about things I don't know about. So there might right, be good right. reasons for everything that happened. All I can yeah, tell you guys is I, what I did and what Bob did and what we agreed 
uh, needed to go in as, as part of this tape, the process of tape research. And Bill England supplied uh, everything that he could find. But he did say at the end of the day that there were 200 plus unmarked tapes. Yeah. In the, wow. in the storage that um, obviously this exercise didn't have a budget for. But we'll talk about that again. I'd love to. That, that, that focus, to. you know, we focus as we go through the box set on what we found, where we found it, and what still could exist. So production release was delayed till June 2023 due to the vinyl pressing plant backlog. Um, and the final June the 2nd, 23 issue of the box set contains 11 mistakes with missing or incorrect masters to the ones advised um, to the listing coordinator at Snapper and to the mastering en uh, engineer. And in my role of master track advisor, I might have contributed uh, because I wasn't involved in the checking to a couple of those mistakes because we didn't communicate enough and people missed tracks like Deep In Your Love. But that was also uh, on the uh, disc before, Deep Inside Your Love. So I think uh, administratively, wires got crossed and I wasn't able to cross-check that. So the final product remains, you know, it is a huge achievement with over 830 tracks of which um, 30 percent or approximately 250 are bonus tracks as rare or alternate versions unreleased tracks or live tracks and i think that is a tremendous achievement and that is what snapper felt was enough to satisfy the price uh, parameter so that that is the story of the process and uh, there's lots of ins and outs in that and stories behind what we found, what, why we picked certain bonus tracks uh, or certain discs, why they're absolutely essential. But basically, they were the rarest of the rare. And, and, and I strongly believe that a lot of the fans would like to hear the stories of these ins and outs. Okay. I mean, interesting, yeah. interesting. Okay. So that's it, guys. That's that's the story of the process. And so happy to go on to um, future parts and we'll discuss the individual. We can talk about a series of individual albums and bonus tracks that got included or didn't get included for various reasons. And what still remains. That would that that would be great. That would be great. Okay. Just, just, from, just from a personal point of view, now, I, I don't consider myself an audiophile in, in, in any respect, really. I, I, as you say, I just go by what I hear, and I've been listening to, you know, four season songs and albums since 1962, but it all sounds great to me I mean, on the box set. They all sound great to me. I, didn't, I don't really, I can't. You know, I can't detect differences like you can. No, you're, you're no, the, the, the thing is, um, well, to some extent, when you're in, in involved in sound changing, you have to train your ear. And yeah, yeah. A period of years. I've been doing mastering now for 20 years. Um, oh, the biggest, wow. The biggest difficulty is that uh, the engineer who taught me passed away in 2015, uh, which was a bit of a bummer. Um, and he was a great friend, a huge great friend. And we, we constantly wrote about these things. So I've not had a, a sort of an engineering um, assistant um, since since then, but I'm still using the same tools that we use then. And they're still reliable in that context in terms right. of evaluating sound. And the thing about listening is that loudness fools the ear. The thing ah. to listen for is clarity separation and balance that is loudness to quietness so they should all be in in balance and the best mix has the best clarity the best separation even in a mono uh, recording you should be able to hear the crispness and the definition of individual instruments alongside the vocal 
it shouldn't be muddy in any way you, you know you should you know you, you learn this over time and it depends what speakers you're listening on or what type of headphones you've got on whether you pick these things up but there are an awful lot of processing tools now that actually change sound whilst you're listening to it you know so in the players right well i guess ken you you would be considered uh, you know like in the vinyl community on youtube what what they call an audio file that, that no just... no i'm not an audio file no i'm an amateur sound engineer um and, and nothing more than that i i don't an audio file believes you have to have the best equipment you know you have to have top notch everything understood else. understood um, whereas i i just take the sound and how the brain and the ears perceive it Great. and it's individual and personal but from my point of view i try to use meters um to measure what sound is doing and also listening tests with my own ears uh, but unfortunately uh, that's that's been my event and i've lost hearing in, in my right ear to a substantial um amount at the moment so i can't do anything further in terms of sound i can still hear tracks in mono but stereo tracks don't sound right unless i turn my head to 45 <laughs> degrees so that this one ear picks up the two stereo channels you're like frankie valley used to be when you tried yeah. to talk to him, he would always turn away from me <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> wrong to him <laughs> so so that's 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 it guys we We've we've done, great, we've done a great show, and I hope uh, it interested uh, people. And uh, I thank you all for your um, interest and uh, well, we for giving you. me this opportunity. I thank you, Ken. I thank you. <laughs> this is great. Okay. okay, so I think my chili is cooked, and I'll go and enjoy. Uh, enjoy, enjoy. Yeah. Thanks to uh, you guys in the in the states. Okay. Okay. Oh, great. Okay.